Hello everyone, this is uh, Chris with The Ancient Scholar. Uh, uh, so hopefully, from the introduction of the video, uh, hopefully it, it showed out. Uh, you guys were able to see there was uh, perhaps a little difference uh, between my uh, left eye versus my right eye. And um, as you, you may have guessed by, by the, uh, the title of this video, uh, what I'm talking about is I'm, I'm talking about the pupil specifically. And uh, no, I'm not, uh, I haven't overdosed on some sort of illicit substance. Uh, what I've actually had today is something known as a dilated eye exam. I uh, developed some floaters in my right eye, and uh, there's a possibility of the posterior vitreous humor being detached, which isn't necessarily an uncommon thing to occur in people as they get older, and, and specifically people like myself who are what we call myopic or nearsighted, uh, because our eye is a little longer than it should be, and sometimes that can put some stress on the, on the, the vitreous humor, which is inside of the eye, attached to uh, the retina. Uh, of course, when everyone gets floaters, one has to be very worried about um, the retina, which is actually the, the back part of the eye where um, all the sensory input um, comes in. Uh, so, so far, everything's looking good. But I, I thought, well, shoot, why not just do a video on uh, midriasis versus meiosis? Uh, now, I've went ahead and, and anticipated, in anticipation for today, I made some notes simply because uh, my vision is a little fuzzy and I, I can't um, write all that well. Um, so what I want to do is just compare and contrast uh, midriasis versus meiosis, and uh, let's just start at you know, where does it happen, how does it occur. So when we talk about midriasis and meiosis, I hope everybody can see this rather interesting drawing. Um, I'm going to just start at basic nervous system physiology. I have the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, and um, from that I have the peripheral nervous system that branches out. This is a pretty basic um, neuro, neuro anatomy and physiology. Uh, and that the peripheral nervous system is how uh, we either get signals to the central nervous system, a sensory input, um, and that's of course what we call ascending or afferent uh, fibers, and how we get uh, how the nervous system then uh, puts uh, takes uh, processes that sensory information and then takes it and um, transmits it out to the body, and that's what we call uh, efferent or descending, and this is generally in the form of some sort of, of motor um, impulse. So when we talk about the peripheral nervous system, uh, there are several branches, and the branch that I want to talk about is something called the autonomic nervous system, which is basically the automatic nervous system. It does it, it, it runs things and, and works really without us... Um, really being aware of it, and I just think of autonomic as automatic. Now, there are two major divisions of the autonomic. You have the sympathetic nervous system and the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. And when we talk about the eyes, or the pupils specifically, um, what we're talking about is um, radial muscle uh, versus circular muscle. Um, now, if I have a sympathetic response, that response is actually going to work on the radial muscle of the eye and cause dilation, and of course here I have normal pupils for comparison, um, but if I have a parasympathetic response, that will work on circular muscle and that will cause constriction. Dilation is midriosis and um, constriction is meiosis. So that's just kind of the basic uh, neuroanatomy and physiology, and of course we know that a uh, typically a sympathetic response uh, postganglionic response will be the neurotransmitter, a norepinephrine, and the postganglionic uh, response for parasympathetic uh, response is going to be uh, acetylcholine, and of course you have different receptors for acetylcholine. You have a muscarinic, nicotinic, and then different branches of, of, of subtypes of nicotinic and muscarinic, uh, muscarinic. Uh, and of course we have alpha and beta and different types of alpha and a few different types of beta receptors. But anyway, that's just kind of the basic physiology of going on, what's going on. So let me just go ahead and, and show you a picture of a, perhaps a little more detail. And here I have the two types of response. So here I have the radial muscle. And the way the radial muscle it works basically is that it contracts and it, it it's in the iris, it contracts and as it contracts, the pupil literally opens up. So the, the radial muscle, when activated by the sympathetic nervous system, uh, is basically pulling out. And, and basically, there's just an opening here. That's actually what the pupil is. It's just nothing but a hole. And as that muscle contracts and pulls out, it opens up. Now, contrast that with the circular muscle here. And the circular muscle is, is what I think of in respiratory is it's very similar 
to the, the, the at least in function, um, to the muscles that surround our non-cartilaginous airways, uh, and our, our bronchi, our bronchioles rather. And of course, when that muscle, that smooth muscle, is activated in the lungs um, through the parasympathetic nervous system, um, of course, uh, the muscle tightens up and it causes uh, constriction. Well, a very similar process is occurring here. Is that circular muscle, and I can kind of drew the little arrows as as uh, just to kind of show you that in a parasympathetic response, um, or what we call a cholinergic response, the pupil is going to go ahead and constrict. It's actually the opening is just closing. That little opening is becoming smaller as that circular muscle kind of wraps around and squeezes and, and, and closes uh, the pupil up. So generally, in a normal person, we have some sort of equilibrium, if you will, that's going to occur between the sympathetic, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And, and generally, that's how it is in, in, in most situations, is that it's not necessarily the sympathetic versus a the parasympathetic. There's generally an equilibrium that's established, and maybe it's a little more parasympathetic, a little more sympathetic. Um, but again, you don't want one system or the other totally ever taking over. That actually uh, causes lots of problems. Okay, so let's just go ahead and talk about the, the, the different things. And these are just a few of the things that can cause uh, midriasis versus meiosis. So here I have a, basically a, a big old laundry list of things. So when we talk about midriatics or um, dilation, um, what comes should come to mind are anticholinergic medications. And these are medications, anticholinergic is anti basically anti acetylcholine uh, post ganglionic they, they they antagonize the action of the parasympathetic nervous system in essence they block certain parts of the parasympathetic nervous system so when that happens that allows the sympathetic nervous system to take over and become dominant and that's actually where you see your dilation your midriatic your midriatic action occurring with anticholinergic agents is it's not that they're activating the sympathetic nervous system they're simply uh, deactivating or antagonizing the parasympathetic nervous system so some examples might be um, atropine scopolamine um, uh, tropocanamide, which is actually the medication that I was given today to to um, dilate my pupil for the dilated eye exam, very common. Um, and these are ad anticholinergic agents, and of course we use some of them. Sometimes we use atropine or atropine-like agents uh, as uh, what we call backdoor bronchodilators um, when you talk about um, certain um, types of um, agents such as atrovent, which is a, a derivative of atropine. All of these are, are basically derivatives of the, the parent molecule atropine. Um, some other medications, LSD, mescaline, PCP, ketamine, head injury, and damage to cranial nerve 3. So cranial nerve 3 is interesting. It's what's known as the oculomotor nerve. Um, it goes to the eye. And if I damage that, that is actually uh, the major parasympathetic nerve uh, to the eye. And, of course, if I damage that, the sympathetic nervous system then can take over unopposed, and that's what causes pupil dilation. And, of course, head injury can also put pressure on sympathetic uh, nerves that innervate the uh, cranial nerve 3. Um, we look at meiosis. Lots of things can cause meiosis or, or pupil constriction. Opioids like morphine and heroin. Cholinergics, so medications that, that um, either mimic the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. These could be things like acetylcholine, uh, obviously. Uh, nerve agents like organophosphate insecticides, VX, VD, when we talk about um, uh, weapons of mass destruction. Um, certain antipsychotic agents like uh, Haldol, Thorazine, something called Horner syndrome, where I can damage the uh, sympathetic uh, uh, nervous system, uh, specifically to the face and I could have some issues with the face. Pontine hemorrhage, this is actually one of the, the few types of, of head issues. Um, it's actually a stroke in the pontine areas, very deep in the brain, um, in the pons, and that can actually cause pupil constriction instead of the typical dilation that we, we, um, we think of when we think of a head, head issue. And even cluster, certain types of cluster headaches can cause meiosis. So that hopefully is just a kind of a basic introduction to meiosis and, and mydriosis.